Another time, he comes to me and says, Lord Madam, I must ask your pardon. I was at your mantua makers yesterday and dressed my head in your lace paneers and I would fain have borrowed them to have gone to the Ridotto at Vauxhall last night, but I could not persuade her to lend them me. But, however, she lent me your Calimanco gown and Madam Nuttall's mob and one of her smocks, and so I went thither to pick up some gentlemen to dance. And did you make a good hand of it, princess, says I? No, madam, says he. I picked up two men who had no money, but, however, they proved to be my old acquaintance and very good gentlewomen they were. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Amorous Histories. Thank you for joining me. I'm Annie, your host and resident history nerd for the next 20 minutes. If you like the vibes, you can follow me wherever you get your podcasts and on social media. I'm at Amorous Histories on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and TikTok and at Amorous Hist Pod on Twitter. You can like, share, comment and all that good stuff so more people will join us at this cute little party. Transcripts and sources for each show are available on the website amorousshistories.co.uk along with links to the bookshop.org affiliate account and some other goodies. Uh, apologies if the audio is a bit echoey this week, I'm sat somewhere different and I'm not a sound technician so I will do my best. <laughs> I've been talking about doing this episode for months and it's finally here. Today we're going to be talking about a proper babe, Princess Serafina. Once again, we're travelling back to the 18th century, undeniably my favourite time period. We're in 1730s London with a gentleman's servant, an OG drag queen, John Cooper, also known as Princess Serafina. Richter Norton, the granddaddy of queer British history scholars, introduces Serafina on his website as, quote, the first recognisable drag queen in English history. That is the first gay man for whom dragging it up was an integral part of his identity. That's right, I'm offering up to you, dear listeners, an 18th century drag queen. Much like episode 4, which was about 18th century mollies, go back and have a listen if you haven't already, we have to talk about semantics first. When we talk about LGBTQ plus people in history, we can't make assumptions and the language we use to talk about them should be considered in the round. In 18th century Britain, men who engaged in sexual activity with other men were referred to as mollies and sodomites, amongst many other terms. In this episode, the words molly and mollies will be used in reference to men of the period who had same-sex relationships, because this is the term accepted by the men themselves. Equally, we can't necessarily use the words trans or non-binary or any of their relatives, because they're not descriptions people from the 18th century would recognise. Although it's important to say that that just because an 18th century person wouldn't be familiar with words like trans, that doesn't mean they weren't someone who we would today recognise as being trans or non-binary. Trans people have always existed, and this discussion of words is just academic semantics. In the case of John Cooper slash Princess Serafina, most of what we know about them comes from court documents, as is generally the case for working class queer people in history. In these documents, they are referred to by others who knew them as both John Cooper and Princess Serafina. The latter is the Molly maiden name John was christened with by his fellow Mollies. Generally, this is the name that men in Molly houses would use when in each other's private company. However, in this case, those outside the Molly subculture also referred to John as Princess Serafina. To learn more about Molly House Ritual, do pop on back to episode 4 once you're done here. When it comes to pronouns, we see people use both he, him and she, her to refer to John Serafina. So what's a responsible history podcaster to do? I can't ask someone who's been dead hundreds of years how to refer to them. Well, I'm going to stick with Princess Serafina because A, that's the Molly maiden name they were christened with and B, I think it sounds better than John. (laughs) Sorry to any Johns out there. As for pronouns, I think for ease, I'll use they, them, as that covers all bases and doesn't misgender anyone. With that in mind, let's get to the good stuff. The majority of our knowledge about Princess Serafina comes from a July 1732 court transcript, but for once, it was not the Molly on trial. In fact, Princess Serafina was the one who was bringing the charges against a man named Thomas Gordon. 
Serafina accused Thomas of, quote, putting him in fear and taking from him a coat, a waistcoat, a pair of breeches, a pair of socks, a pair of silver shoe buckles, a shirt, a stock, a silver stock buckle, four and a half pennies in money, on the 30th of May, 1732. The testimonies given as part of this London trial reveal details about Princess Serafina that would have otherwise been lost to history. Serafina lived in London, lodging at 11 Eagle Court, just off the Strand, and was a gentleman's servant who was between jobs when the incident happened. When testifying in court, Mary Poplar said, quote, Her Highness lives with Mr Tull in Eagle Court in the Strand, and calls him her master, because she was nurse to him and his wife when they were both in a salivation. But the princess is rather Mr Tull's friend than his domestic servant. In salivation means that Mr and Mrs Tull had mercury poisoning, but not because they ingested it by accident, rather they would have taken mercury as a medical treatment. Mercury was used to treat everything from syphilis to TB, constipation to parasites, and in a salivation comes from one of mercury's side effects, producing too much saliva. If you're interested in learning more about mercury as a medicine, there is plenty of info out there on it. Princess Serafina was known in the local area to dress in women's clothes regularly, whether it was a normal day or a special occasion like a masquerade. Mary Poplet tells the court, quote, I have seen her several times in women's clothes. She commonly used to wear a white gown and a scarlet cloak, with her hair frizzled and curled all around her forehead. And then she would so flutter her fan and make such fine curtsies that you would not have known her from a woman. She takes great delight in balls and masquerades and always chooses to appear at them in female dress, that she may have the satisfaction of dancing with fine gentlemen. We know that Serafina enjoyed a good masquerade and went to the Ridotto al Fresco held at Vauxhall Gardens in June 1732. Masquerades were places of much naughtiness with people attending in fancy dress and sometimes cross-dressing. They were places for sex workers to find clients and queer people to find lovers. Mary Robinson tells the court, quote, Another time he comes to me and says, Lord, madam, I must ask your pardon. I was at your mantua makers yesterday and dressed my head in your laced pin ears and I would fain to have borrowed them to have gone to the Ridotto at Vauxhall last night but I could not persuade her to lend them to me. But, however, she lent me your Calimanico gown and Madame Nuttall's mob and one of her smocks, so I went thither to pick up some gentlemen to dance. And did you make a good hand of it, princess, says I? No, madam, he says. I picked up two men who had no money, but, however, they proved to be my old acquaintance and very good gentlewomen they were. One of them has been transported for counterfeiting masquerade tickets and the other went to the masquerade in a velvet domini and picked up an old gentleman and went to bed with him. But as soon as the old fellow found out that he had got a man by his side, he cried out murder. As you can tell, the women who knew Serafina commonly referred to her as she, her, princess and highness. Mary Poplet says, quote, I never heard that she had any other name than the princess Serafina. Mary Ryler told the court, sometimes we call her princess and sometimes miss. When the first witness to refer to John Cooper as princess, the court quite literally says, what princess? The speaker, Jane Jones, says the prosecutor, he goes by that name. And then everyone just carries on as normal. The women also clearly know, but seemingly don't care, that Serafina is a molly. Margaret Holder, the landlady of the King's Arms, has this exchange with the court. Holder, quote, I believe the prisoner is an honest man, but the prosecutor and Kit Sanford, too, used to come to my cellar with such sort of people. Court, quote, what sort of people? Holder, quote, why, to tell you the truth, he's one of the runners that carries messages between gentlemen in that way. Court, quote, in what way? Holder, quote, why, he's one of them you call molly culls. He gets his bread that way. To my certain knowledge, he has got many a crown under some gentleman for going of sodomitting errands. She says this in court, but luckily nothing comes of it. In fact, we don't have any evidence that Princess Serafina, aka John Cooper, was ever put to trial for any of their, what was at the time, illegal activity. Now, let's turn to the reason why all of these people are in court talking about Princess Serafina, the cross-dressing Molly. 
Serafina went out drinking on the 29th of May, Whit Monday, which I had to Google, and it's a holy day in the Christian calendar. So like any good British person, Princess Serafina has gone up to the quote, night cellar on the lash, as God would have wanted. But when it was time to return to their lodgings just before 2am, Serafina finds that they can't get in. They knock, but no one answers. So obviously they do what any sensible person would do and return to the night cellar, the King's Arms by Leicester Fields, for another pint of beer. It's at this point Princess Serafina claims that the defendant, Thomas Gordon, comes and sits down next to them and they get chatting about a mutual acquaintance, Mr Price. They drink three, quote, hot pints of something the landlady Margaret Holder called Huckle and Buff, which is, quote, gin and ale made hot, together whilst talking about the people they both knew. And as Serafina settles their bill and leaves, Thomas follows. Thomas comments about what a nice morning it is and asks Serafina to join him for a walk. Serafina agrees and they go together to Chelsea Fields, where Thomas makes his attack. The following is a quote from Princess Serafina in the court transcript. We went to Chelsea Fields and turning up to a private place among some trees, he clapped his left hand to the right side of my coat and tripped up my heels and holding a knife to me, God yet damn ye, he said, if you offer to speak or stir or kill ya, give me ye ring. I gave it him and, and he put it on his own finger. Then he made me pull off my coat and waistcoat and breeches. I begged that he would not kill me nor leave me naked. No, says he, I'll only change with ya. Come pull off your shirt and put on mine. So he stripped and dressed himself in my clothes and I put on his. There was four and a half pennies in my breeches and I found three halfpennies in his. Halfpennies or half pennies being less in value than pennies. So Thomas has robbed Princess Serafina of their clothes and money. He then threatens that if Serafina reports his crime, he'll quote, swear you're a sodomite and gave me the clothes to let you bugger me. Now, this is super interesting because sodomy was an offence that you could be hanged for, just like robbery. Six years previously in London, 1726, Mother Clapp's Molly House had been raided and Thomas Wright, William Griffin and Gabriel Lawrence had all been t- tried and hanged for sodomy. And of course, sodomy trials and executions were happening in London in the six years between the raid at Mother Clapp's and this incident at Chelsea Fields. Sodomy is hard to prove, so Thomas knew they would be his words against Serafina's. Interestingly, it seems that Princess Serafina's sexuality was a bit of an open secret in the local area. Many know them to be a molly and someone who often dressed in women's clothes. So if Thomas also knew this, he would have thought the accusation of sodomy to be more believable and nasty enough a threat to deter Serafina from pursuing justice. Princess Serafina was not deterred though. They wanted their clothes back. So what follows is what appears to be a couple of hours of the pair strolling around London, going in and out of different drinking establishments, accusing each other of theft and sodomy. After robbing Serafina and Chelsea Fields, Thomas asks them if they want to go to the White Horse by Hyde Park. Serafina, dressed in Thomas's clothes, declines because they have family in that area and they don't want to be spotted in Thomas's scabby outfit. So the two of them make their way to the two brewers on Little Windmill Street, where they meet some men trying to get into the pub that's closed. One of these men is John Thorpe, who testifies in court. Serafina tells the men Thomas robbed them, and Thomas says Serafina tried to bugger him. John Thorpe doesn't want to get involved and tells them to, quote, make it up between themselves and change clothes again. Thomas is obviously having none of this, and the group of men now make their way to the White Hart in Knaves Acre. When they reach the White Hart at about 6am, Thomas Gordon tells the owner there, Robert Shaw, that, quote, this fellow charges me with a robbery. We've been in Chelsea Fields, and he gave me his clothes to let him commit sodomy with me, and now he wants them again. Serafina, Thomas and the men they've accrued on the way then have a couple more drinks together whilst arguing about the incident. When it comes to paying for the drinks, Serafina points out that Thomas stole their money so they don't have enough to pay. Somehow Serafina ends up going to their cousin's house on Wader Street 
to ask to borrow some money. This is how the court learns that the cousin, a distiller, is not Serafina's biggest fan. John Thorpe testifies that the cousin said, quote, as you're in the neighbourhood, I don't care to be scandalised by you. There's a shilling, but go about your business and let me hear no more of you. If you are a vile fellow, and I'm afraid you'll come to an ill end. There's always one. If you're not scandalising your family, are you really living? Anyway, Serafina pays up using their cousin's money and the unhappy group move on to the next pub, the Coach and Horses by St Giles' Church. Apparently they were looking for Justice Mercer, but he was still in bed, so they had to go to the pub instead. I think Thomas must have been held against his will at this point. I don't think he's willingly walking around London with the person he'd robbed looking for justices. Whilst in the Coach and Horses for about an hour and a half, Thomas writes a letter to his parents on Drury Lane, and John Thorpe delivers it. When John returns from delivering the letter, the group are no longer in the coach and horses. Poor John. What happened next, I'll tell you in Serafina's own words. Quote, I had charged a constable with the prisoner. I told him so. Go and do it then, says the justice, and swear to the things and I'll commit him. So we went towards Tyburn Road to Marilee Bone Fields. And there the men let the prisoner go. What do you do, says I. Why, what would you have us do, said they. He charges you with sodomy and says you gave him the clothes on that account. Another man coming by at the same time, I desired his assistance. But they, telling him that I was a molly, he said I ought to be hanged and he'd had nothing to do with me. Then the prisoner began to run and I after him. But one of the two men who expected to be paid for their day's work kicked up my heels and as I was rising he struck me down again. I was very much hurt and spit blood so that I could not follow them and they all got over a ditch and escaped. I went to my lodgings in Eagle Court. So it appears that in the time, I'm guessing maybe two or three hours, these men have spent with Serafina and Thomas. They have decided that they don't care much for Serafina, don't necessarily believe them and have concluded that they're a molly. So the princess is down, but not out. Serafina returns to their lodgings after one hell of a night, telling the court, quote, they were surprised to see me come home in such a shabby dress. After explaining the night they'd had, Serafina's friends say they know exactly who the robber was and where he lived. Serafina continues to tell the court, quote, so I got Justice Gifford's warrant the same day and finding the prisoner in a brandy shop door in Drury Lane, we seized him. The prisoner was sent to the roundhouse jail and carried before the justice the next day. Thomas tells the justice that Serafina put their yard, that's a penis, into his hand twice. That justice asks Thomas, quote, You had a long knife, it seems. Why did you not cut it off? I would have done so. Interesting words there from the justice who thinks it's fine to go around chopping people's penises off. And that's how it ended in court in July 1732 with all of these people telling the justices about Princess Serafina and their cross-dressing molly ways. So what became of all of this and Thomas Gordon? Well, the court transcript says, quote, Several of the inhabitants of Drury Lane gave the prisoner the character of an honest working man and the jury acquitted him. And that was the end of that. I don't even know if the princess got their clothes back. Sorry for a unsatisfying end to a long, winding and very drunken story. I'm grateful to researchers like Richter Norton who have made the stories like these more accessible. The sources I used for this episode were his website richternorton.co.uk and an article he wrote for the Vauxhall History Society called Princess Serafina Steps Out at Vauxhall Gardens. And I'd like to thank Julia Fassett for sending me the PDF of her article A Catching or Letting the 18th Century Be Trans because it's behind a paywall. Sob. It's an important essay and I'm very glad I was able to read it. As ever, all of my sources are listed on the website. And if you, kind listener, have any sources you think would be useful for me or others listening to the episode, please share the details via the platform you're listening on, the Amorous Histories website or social media. Just to reiterate, trans and non-binary people have always been here. 
will always be here and we need to champion their history and protect their future. I hope you enjoyed learning about Princess Serafina's unfortunate adventures. Episodes are due every two weeks and in the next one I'll be talking to Dr Julie Taddeo and Dr Catherine Byrne about sexual assault in period drama television. Please feel free to DM me or email amoroushistories at gmail.com if you have any questions, episode suggestions or want to collab. If you like this episode, please leave Amorous Histories a kind review and some stars on your podcast app or website. You should be able to find me wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow my socials at Amorous Histories on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and TikTok and at Amorous Hist Pod on Twitter. Transcripts and sources are at amorousshistories.co.uk. Until next time, stay sexy. <laughs>